Welcome everybody to the next uh, seminar in the series from the Melbourne Climate Futures Academy, aka the Climate and Energy College, um, which is a series that's supported by the European Commission via the Strategic uh, Partnership for Implementation of the Paris Agreement, SPIPA, uh, and is also supported by Melbourne Climate Futures more generally. Um, and uh, this is part of a, of a significant series that we've got around the um, specifically relating to things like the, the, the COP process. And today it's uh, extremely topical for us to be talking about agriculture at a time when agriculture's role as kind of a villain, victim or savior around the climate problem is, is clearly front of mind uh, in places like Australia. So it's great to have a couple of people who uh, have been specifically working on the questions of climate mitigation um, in agriculture and their potential co-benefits and, and costs. Um, and that's particularly um, Natalie Doran-Brown and Rochelle Meyer. So Natalie um, has uh, done quite a lot of work around things like carbon neutral farming in Australia uh, and thinking about the, um, the options that are available for agricultural systems to reduce their emissions at a time when clearly uh, a lot of people in the industry are pushing towards that uh, and Australia's targets look like they're gonna require it. And Rochelle has done some particular work around soil carbon in some particular on-farm systems and now is working uh, particularly around cataloging really the, the uh, co-benefits and costs of trees on farms. So kind of what is the, uh, not just the climate benefits, but what are the other ranges of benefits and potential costs from doing that? So they're both gonna talk for about 20 minutes. Um, Natalie's gonna start and then hand over to Rochelle. We'll save questions to the end. And those of you who are veterans of these know that the, the way to post questions is in the Q and A. And at the end, Kate, who's moderating these will kind of, uh, suggest a question, uh, get you to unmute, ask the question. We won't promote you to video because it's, um, it seems to disrupt a Zoom too much. So promote you to uh, unmute you, um, get you to ask the question directly, kind of more engaging that way, and then have the, 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 uh, the speakers respond. So if you can drop those questions in the Q&A, we can kind of sort those out for the end. All right, thanks very much. I'll hand over first to Natalie. Thank you, Peter. So today's topic is on nature-based solutions uh, for agriculture. And as, as Peter said, it's very topical at the moment. I wanted to give a, a brief background on our net zero targets, which of course are in the news a lot at the moment. As we know, Australia has finally committed to achieving a net zero emissions target by 2050. Uh, we don't have a clear uh, roadmap at the national level uh, or 2030 targets, but it is a step in the right direction to at least to have committed to that. Now, at the state level, many state governments have established a pathway and they've determined targets by 2030 as well as deliverables uh, to achieving that right up until 2050. And Victoria is one of those states. There's also strong support from both industry and farmer groups for achieving a net zero target uh, or carbon neutral farming. Um, so Meat and Livestock Australia and the wool industry have committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, Dairy Australia has committed to a 30% reduction in emissions intensity by 2030 and potentially additional targets on top of that. Uh, Australian pork has said that they will be carbon neutral by 2025. So there's a lot of movement, a lot of relevant work happening, and most importantly, a lot of targets being set. Uh, so agriculture in Australia is one of the larger emitters. While there is more focus on electricity and transport at the moment, once those emissions start to be reduced, then the agricultural emissions as a percentage will rise unless we are taking action as well. So about 12% of our emissions in Australia currently come from agriculture. 
And these carbon neutral targets and net zero targets that people are talking about. Um, so these came about at uh, the COP21 meeting, which was in Paris. And this is when the Paris Agreement was formed to keep global. Now we know in order for this to happen, action needs to occur right away. So even if everyone were to stop emitting uh, immediately, there would still be some warming experienced uh, because those greenhouse gases are still in the atmosphere. So the 2030 timeframe is quite critical. Uh, at the COP26 meetings in Glasgow, there's a lot of talk about uh, what people are committing to by 2030 uh, because it takes time uh, to reduce the emissions. And as you can see in this graph, in order to hit the 2050 target, it's crucial that we start to um, have more action and more commitments. Uh, so aside from government there's and industry, there's also some large uh, international corporations that or multinational corporations that have set their own targets. Now the commercial world has realized that if they need to make last minute changes to drastically reduce their emissions, it's going to cost a lot more than if they have a plan in place uh, to strategically reduce emissions over a longer time period. So this is being driven across a lot of areas. Uh, so at the community level as well, there's becoming stronger support for emissions reduction. And now all we need is a stronger message through government and through policy to help uh, set the scene and to help both businesses and industry have some certainty when they are implementing um, reductions. So the climate challenge for farmers um, is quite important because farmers of course are dependent on both weather and rainfall and the more long-term climate um, scenarios. So there's also greater volatility in the commodity prices for agricultural produce and the inputs that are needed for farming as well. So this creates a number of challenges with the changing climate. Not only is there decreased annual rainfall in many areas, but also changes to the seasonal rainfall. And for farmers, this means having to change the way that farming um, is done. So there's also more extreme weather events, uh, as we've experienced in Victoria and across Australia uh, over the past week and past month. I know some areas in Victoria are still without power after the latest storms, uh, and this makes it more challenging uh, for farmers as well. And just to give you an overview, this is Australia's historical rainfall um, in terms of the seasonal rainfall and when most of the rainfall occurs. So in the north, that pink section and the yellow section, um, that's predominantly summer rainfall. Of course, there'll be rainfall throughout the year, but most of it falls during summer. The green part is more uniform and the blue parts have a winter dominant rainfall. So if you have pasture species that produce more uh, in cooler temperatures, such as in Victoria and Tasmania, having the climate change so that it's a more uniform rain, rainfall pattern, and that might result in less rainfall in winter, spring, more rainfall during summer, then if you have traditional um, plants such as ryegrass in those areas, they will no longer grow as well as some other plants may um, in, in those regions as the rainfall patterns start to change. And you can see here, this is um, 15 years of more recent data. 
and those patterns follow where the arrows go. I'll just go back to the see how they're mostly trending um, towards the south with those patterns. So this means that uh, farmers are having to adapt to these changes that we are already seeing. And this is where nature-based solutions come in. So what are they? Uh, these nature-based solutions are actions that protect, sustainably manage and restore the land. So it's really maximising nature's ability to provide these ecosystem services. Um, and this is more of a holistic uh, view to farming, incorporating, having to adapt to climate change, manage these natural disasters, and make our food production systems more resilient in this changing climate. So there's a component of protecting biodiversity and greater, having greater biodiversity, so less of a focus on monocultures, and also ensuring uh, that humans have well-being throughout this process. So it's not um, purely a financial uh, decision making process and not purely environmental. It's trying to incorporate all the important factors that go into farming systems and into farming communities. And of course, the end result that we're wanting um, is food security uh, being less of a problem in, in Australia since we are a major exporter, but in many developing nations, this is of key concern. So some of the other approaches uh, regenerative agriculture can be considered as um, a nature-based solution because many of the principles and practices align quite well with nature-based solutions. Uh, so regenerative agriculture has a strong focus on soil health, so whether that's uh, improving soil organic matter, conservation tillage, reducing reliance on synthetic fertilizers and using more compost to build that organic matter up. Uh, also improving biodiversity of systems. So having, for example, um, pasture species that are long rooted so that in drier conditions, they can make use of more of the water that's held in the soil profile. Other options that exist, um, uh, one is called climate smart agriculture. And this focuses more on the climate component. So specifically in reducing emissions and adapting to climate change while also ensuring the livelihoods of farmers and food security. So this is used often uh, in development settings and amongst emerging countries with emerging economies. And finally, I just wanted to mention best management practices because within these various approaches, often it's the best management practices that are implemented so these practices improve the efficiency of farm systems. They can increase the profitability, also improve adaptation to uh, the changing climate and reduce emissions intensity on farms. So what are the differences when we're looking at these various approaches? I would say that uh, the regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions are more of a holistic approach. So when you look at best management practices, there may be a number of these within any one of these cogs that you see below. So this might be animal health, or it could be biodiversity of systems, tree planting. Um, so there's a number of practices that are considered the best approach. However, best management practices are not in and of themselves a holistic approach. So it doesn't provide a framework necessarily that farmers can work towards for long-term sustainability, even though these practices will ultimately help the farm system. There, it's very important to consider the whole farm because farming is such an interactive and complex environment. 
So there's a lot of research about the best management practices, and there's also a lot of research around climate smart agriculture. And while these individual practices are also used in regenerative agriculture and for nature-based solutions, there's currently less research on these systems as a whole. And that's understandable given how farming systems, um, they're interactive. So it is a more complex task to take the, the system as a whole and to study the entirety of that system because if one part changes, it has an effect on the rest of the farming system. But this is what is needed for both uh, regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions. So initial studies are very promising and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that these approaches are working well and that they're helping farmers to be more resilient and to uh, reduce negative um, land practices that have caused degradation in the past. Uh, but um, more research is required there. So there are many mitigation options on farm. Some of these uh, are part of nature-based solutions and some are looking more directly at uh, animal systems. So there needs to be some sort of approach that farmers can use so that it's not overwhelming trying to work out which of these options to concentrate on. I won't be going into all of these today, but uh, this slide is just to demonstrate uh, that there are many options. It's, it's not a complete list either. And uh, there, if a framework is used, it can help to focus farmers on a particular area um, to work on. So the best emission reduction opportunities tend to be those that provide co-benefits for farmers. So that co-benefit could be increased efficiency on the farm, which will reduce costs. Um, so that might translate as greater profitability, uh, more environmental sustainability, which means that uh, the farm is viable over the long term and for future generations. And this can help determine the most promising mitigation options that farmers can use. Uh, but within this, uh, the farming approach can be considered. And so if a farmer wants to concentrate more through nature-based solutions or regenerative agriculture, at least there are some categories within that uh, that can be used, such as soil health for regenerative agriculture. Um, and that can help um, to have a particular approach to implementing mitigation options. Uh, so I'd like to look at a carbon neutral case study farm uh, that I did a few years ago. The aim of this research was to study the carbon balance of two different sheep farms and uh, analyze the impact of revegetating the land and basically the offsets of the uh, carbon sequestration through both trees and soils. There were two farms that I looked at. Um, one was called Tallahany in Yass with uh, a fairly low stocking rate, although it was typical to high uh, for the particular region it was in. Uh, that was about eight uh, dry sheep equivalents per hectare. Um, the other was Jigsaw Farms in Hamilton, which had a much higher stocking rate around 25 to 30 dry sheep equivalent per hectare. Um, and both had environmental tree plantings, and Jigsaw Farms also had uh, trees that were sold for wood products. So I calculated the carbon balance of both of these farm systems. And I'm going to concentrate on Tallahany today. So this was a, a small wool farm with uh, extremely fine wool. And when the farm was purchased, it had a lot of difficulties with salinity in the soil. Uh, so the owners planted and regenerated a huge number of trees, 
Uh, they estimated more than 200,000 trees over a 30 year period uh, were implemented on the farm. And over a, around 35 years, there was noticeable improvements in soil quality. And this allowed the emissions from the livestock and uh, the energy and fuel use on the farm to be offset. So by planting these trees and improving the soils, there was also increased production on the farm. There was increased biodiversity of both pasture species, but also improved biodiversity in uh, native animals in the area. And finally, it did result in improved profitability of the farm systems. So these results show that uh, you can see in the top graph here, the farm was purchased in 1983. And as the trees were planted, there's a vast improvement in the carbon balance of the farm, which is the, the purple line. So most of the carbon was sequestered into the trees and there were many benefits because planting trees also has uh, these co-benefits for farmers, such as um, shelter and shade for trees. And this was very important at Tallahanie. The end result was that in uh, around 2015, the farm had sequestered 11 times more carbon through sequestration in trees and soils than it had initially, um, or then it emitted over the same time period through livestock, energy and fuel. So this was a great outcome. And even with the more intensive farm uh, at Jigsaw Farms, they were able to offset their emissions over a seven year period in the farm. And they have continued to plant trees so that they can um, work towards maintaining a carbon neutral standard. So some of the key actions to reduce on-farm emissions uh, are cons to consider using nature-based solutions as a framework uh, to make the job easier uh, of implementing mitigation options. This just allows uh, a focus uh, for the emissions reductions. Um, I recommend that farmers start with a particular area of interest to them. So often farmers have a focus on animals, whether that's um, animal health or animal breeding. Uh, some farmers like to concentrate on their soil health and others really enjoy grazing management um, or the implementation of technology. So the more that a farm enjoys concentrating on an area, the more likely they are uh, to then implement some additional mitigation options. Uh, as I mentioned, working out the co-benefits uh, are very important so that the farmers can gain other benefits from the mitigation options. Improving the efficiency of the farm definitely helps because uh, that produces less emissions versus the product that comes off the farm. And the more that the emissions are reduced, then the less there is that needs to be ultimately offset in another way, such as through uh, carbon sequestration. And also the long-term benefits uh, should be considered. So there may be some advantages throughout the supply chain. And we know as a country that exports most of our agricultural produce, there's starting to be uh, some standards around the environmental credentials for farmers and the expectations of consumers and um, organisations that are purchasing our products throughout the world, uh, that there will be a need for carbon neutral farming into the future. So these options can help to manage the risk of the farms into the future by setting up emissions reduction options um, now that will help. 
So in summary, climate change is already impacting um, our agricultural production and the productivity of our farms. And reducing a farm's uh, impact on, um, in terms of emissions has many co-benefits around sustainability of the farm system and the efficiency of the farms, also the health of the overall farm. Uh, social awareness is increasing for consumers who are wanting to have uh, greater environmental credentials across our farm systems as well. So nature-based solutions and regenerative farming can offer some solutions in this area by providing a framework that farmers can use to work towards carbon neutral farming. Uh, it, initial studies show that it, it makes economic sense and uh, that it improves the resilience of these farming systems. And finally, this is helping us to move towards those net zero targets for 2050 and the targets of 2030 at an industry level and helping us to meet sustainability requirements. Uh, so I'll now uh, swap over to Rochelle, who is going to present on uh, her trees on farm work. Okay, hi. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on um, other co-benefits of um, nature-based solutions, particularly uh, related to those that incorporate planting trees on farm and um, to lesser extent, uh, increasing soil carbon. So, um, let's just, um, I'm going to start out discussing um, productivity benefits and I'll spend a bit of time going into some detail on productivity benefits of having uh, increased amounts of soil carbon as well as uh, trees on farm and um, cover the benefits of uh, the welfare and biodiversity benefits of um, incorporating trees on farm. And Nat's done a good job of covering the carbon sequestration. So I won't um, discuss that one too much, but it does relate to uh, market access, which Nat uh, covered a bit and I'll go over um, briefly at the end. So um, the two main studies that I'm going to be uh, discussing are some work that I did in 2015 looking at um, whole farm modeling of pastures with different amounts of soil carbon and what that meant for productivity. And then also some current work that I'm doing um, on trees on farm. So the project is uh, about maximizing co-benefits and um, looking to uh, determine uh, monetary estimates of um, what the co-benefits are providing farmers. But uh, one aspect of that project is to develop a database of uh, co-benefits and risks of incorporating trees on farm. And that um, in an Excel version will be ready later this year. And we're uh, planning on getting a web-based front end for that early next year to increase its accessibility. So um, if you're interested in that, um, it, it will be publicly available. Uh, the um, literature that we've gone through uh, over 1,100 citations, including late gray literature, and we've um, decided on um, some criteria for including the, the literature into the database. Um, primarily, it has to have uh, data on the impacts of trees on farm. And um, the geographic range is Southern Australia and New Zealand. And we're in the process of entering that literature now. Uh, we've gone through the citations and we know which ones are going in and uh, which ones are excluded, but there are still a few uh, to enter. So uh, the data that I'll be presenting today is preliminary results from that. So uh, soil organic carbon uh, serves many roles in farming systems and uh, they're categorized here as 
uh, bio biological, physical, and chemical. I'm going to be focused really on increasing nutrient availability and water availability, but they um, but soil organic carbon does reduce risks of erosion, increases biodiversity of the soil. So there are um, many other uh, benefits that soil organic carbon is providing to a farm. Um, but uh, I'm going to just uh, focus on nitrogen and water. So uh, this is the study um, using whole farm modeling that I mentioned. Uh, the values here are pasture production, kilograms of dry matter per hectare per year at a high rainfall site in high carbon soils, and um, compared that to um, a system that's exactly the same but has lower soil carbon. And you can see that that has reduced the productivity of those pastures. And on this site, that's really driven by uh, nitrogen availability. And um, at, oops, at the low rainfall site, um, the high and low carbon soils are fairly similar, but when you incorporate the impact that having low carbon soils has on uh, plant available water holding capacity, you can see that there's a reduction in uh, in productivity of the pastures. So um, the two main takeaways here are that the soil organic carbon is increasing plant productivity and the drivers for that are different on the two sites. One site is really driven by nitrogen availability during the spring growing period and up the other site it's plant available water. So, but we did some um, basic uh, valuing of that added production um, based on a hay value that represents uh, hay with low legume content and a 60%, uh, assuming 60% can be harvested. And so um, on the low rainfall site, uh, $26 per hectare per year and $73 per hectare per year on the two different soils. Um, and that would be attributed to increased water availability. And then on the low, on the high rainfall site, it was $41 and $95 per hectare per year on the two different soils. Um, I should note that um, this is, the, the difference between the soils here is, is uh, there's a big difference between the high and the low carbon soil. So it would be very difficult and take quite some time for a farmer with low carbon soils to get to this level, but it does um, provide an, uh, an estimate of what uh, value a farmer with high carbon soil is getting from the carbon in their soil, uh, soil organic matter, generally speaking. Uh, so co-benefits from trees, uh, there are, uh, many, and I'm going to discuss uh, a selection of them, um, but uh, the direct impacts on plant growth uh, include sheltering from wind and providing a cooling effect during warm periods, um, increased animal production, both from increased uh, plant production, uh, as well as direct effects of shade and shelter. So heat stress um, can interfere with um, several aspects of production uh, um, and providing that shade can increase feed intake um, and dairy cows are particularly susceptible to heat stress. So um, providing that shade uh, can mean more milk production and increases in fertility of livestock. Um, during cold parts of the times of the year, um, the shelter uh, will um, provide a way to reduce impacts of cold snaps on uh, lamb mortality and or shorn sheep um, are also susceptible to cold periods. Um, there are many environmental benefits. Uh, trees reduce erosion uh, through their root structure, uh, stabilizing soil, but also the reduction in wind speed also reduces wind erosion. Um, as Natalie mentioned in the Tallahassee farm, um, plantings can reduce impacts of salinity. Uh, it's a uh, 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 major uh, reason for trees to get planted in, in many areas of Australia. Um, 
It can also increase water quality and reduce evaporation losses from dams. And I'll go into more detail on these different benefits of trees. So firstly, this is uh, from the database, um, just uh, limiting the criteria to plantings that were done for shelter and uh, selection of the records uh, for shelter for both crops and pasture and the percent increase in production associated with a given study. And it, it includes um, the area of calculation. So some of these were um, including the area of the planting um, that area is lost to production. So um, if you include that area, um, it, uh, it's basically saying that uh, the product that positive value is saying the production in the sheltered area is offsetting the lost production of planting trees in that area. Um, the sheltered areas are just a, a comparison between uh, pasture growth in sheltered areas versus unsheltered areas. Um, you get quite a variability, um, but um, you can tell that generally the entire area um, calculations are slightly smaller because they're taking into account that lost production. Um, but there are still some um, quite substantial increases in production with these shelter plantings. Um, I was going to note a couple of things. Uh, the third to the bottom, 60% um, increase in production uh, based on an experiment published in a journal. Um, they note that that increase in production more than offset the losses due to um, planting an area to trees, but they didn't um, report the percentage um, incorporating that lost area. Um, some of the higher values, uh, particularly the last one there, that includes um, several things. Um, it's dry matter consumed, so it's not only increases in production, but what the animals are eating. Um, and I think much of that um, increase is also due to the shelter plantings having impacts on uh, salinity issues on the farm. So they regained area um, to production that, that had been lost to salinity issues. So that's incorporating a, a few different um, impacts of having the trees. Um, so the database is showing um, where this information is coming from to, to give an idea of the robustness of, of the data provided. Um, and you can search this um, based on uh, location or um, rainfall to see, um, to get uh, values that might be more representative of, of your area. Some um, animal productivity co-benefits that are reported in the database. This uh, some on milk. The first one is interesting. They actually had to remove a shelter belt, and the following year they uh, reported an eleven percent decline in production, even though the district average had increased four point two five percent. The milk production uh, is quite, as I mentioned, sensitive to to heat stress. So there's been some experiments uh, looking at how shade can uh, alleviate some of those impacts. And those experiments I'll use artificial shade, but uh, they range from three to 14%, the 3% being mild heat stress in New Zealand and 14% was um, more moderate heat stress in cows that have dark coats. Um, for sheep, the, the information is uh, more related to cold weather. Um, reductions in mortality have been observed um, because the shelter is uh, reducing wind speeds and um, providing a, a, a sort of a, a, a way for farmers to uh, prevent those losses. And there's, excuse me, there's a study um, that uses artificial shelter uh, and in high stocking densities, they found an increase in live weight and wool growth. Um, and then the, the last study here, looking at carrying capacity, found a two times increase in uh, the ability in the carrying capacity. So the stocking rate more than doubled 
and that was due to um, the plantings uh, addressing salinity issues as well. So um, on that front, um, there are many environmental benefits of having trees on farm, but these also um, do end up having direct or indirect impacts on production. So uh, as that salinity example I just gave shows, um, the plantings reduce salinity issues, um, but that will uh, can really have large impacts on the production of the, of the whole farm. This pod. Trees and soil carbon uh, both can reduce risks of erosion. And um, clearly keeping your soil on your farm is a, is a benefit to the farm as well. Um, and uh, plantings around dams and along riparian areas increase uh, water quality and reduce losses of that water um, to evaporation, particularly during hot periods. Uh, so, um, yeah, and on the, the water quality issue is also a welfare issue as it um, prevents um, spread of disease uh, when, when you have better quality water. Um, these welfare benefits that are listed here are in the database as farmer observations, which is very, um, I, I think it's a, an interesting aspect of the database to be able to incorporate this sort of information as um, a lot of these kinds of data are not available um, in the literature. Um, and you have the biosecurity benefits of reducing uh, disease transfer um, or parasites. Uh, shade and shelter are a productivity benefit, but also a welfare benefit and it has implications for animal behavior as well. Um, so this slide is very crowded and I'm just going to highlight a few things of, of, about the biodiversity co-benefits of trees on farm. The database has biodiversity benefits as, as text. Um, so uh, this first um, bit of information is a survey of farmers uh, with ha that have different types of plantings on their farm and the majority of all of them observed increases in biodiversity uh, with their plantings. Maybe about a quarter of them didn't observe any change and a few didn't know whether or not it had changed or not, but uh, none of the farmers are reporting decreases in biodiversity with trees on farm. Um, the studies that look at arthropods all sh show increases in abundance and species richness um, with uh, when there's trees present. Um, and some of these are particularly looking at predatory um, arthropods that could uh, um, have impacts on farm pests. Uh, in this study looking at birds, this two thirds of the species um, that were observed in a plantation are in decline in Western Australia. Uh, we have some information on koalas and um, quite a lot of information on bats. So um, in this study, uh, areas that had tree densities from 10 to 34 trees per hectare um, had the most uh, species richness and species abundance of bats. And um, again, there is implications there for um, uh, controlling or um, regulating invertebrate and pest species on farms. So uh, Nat did cover this. Um, there are many um, sort of opportunities for farmers. They, they have more um, places where they can uh, sell their products if they can meet these criteria. And in some cases they bring a premium. Um, but as time goes on, and these are um, more and more expected, um, it'll be very important for um, finding um, places to sell your products to be able to um, show these benefits um, in your farm system. And um, yeah, there are other benefits as well around income diversification from carbon and timber. And also uh, there's a study showing that uh, you can increase your um, 
land values with trees on the property. For large properties, that's between around 20 and 30% of the property, and it, it goes up on smaller properties. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention um, with the welfare is, and it's come up a bit in our research, is that um, farmers actually um, get a large welfare benefit from having trees on farm as well. So if the stock are enjoying the shade and the shelter from the wind, um, people working on the farm do as well. And um, it's an important uh, amenity value of having the trees on the, on the farm. Uh, before I wrap up, I want to thank our funders, uh, MLA, DJPR, and the Tasmanian Climate Change Office. And um, I mentioned that the database will be publicly available. And when those uh, versions are uh, uh, put online, uh, they'll, they'll either be on this website or there'll be a link on the website so you can access them there. So thank you for your time. And I guess we will open it up to questions. Yes, thank you, Rochelle. And thanks to Natalie as well. Um, so we, yeah, we'll go over to questions now. And so there's already a few in the Q&A. Um, if anyone else has got any more, um, just please add them in and also upvote the ones that you want most answered. Um, so as Peter said, what we'll do is we will go through the list and we'll allow or we'll invite you to talk and to ask your questions. So you can just unmute. So first off, we'll go to Shane. Um, Shane, if you're there, would you like to ask your question, please? Unmute. Okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, I think I'm unmuted okay. now. Um, yep. my, um, my, my questions are actually for Natalie, probably primarily. Um, I guess one of the great obstacles to um, measuring soil carbon has been the need to take assays all over the farm and it's really hard you know different blocks have different soil carbon characteristics and I guess one of the um, great advances would be some kind of remote sensing of soil to be able to measure soil carbon using drones or some other kind of technology. Do you know whether that's been um, developed or developing? That's, that's my first question. Uh, yes. There has been some research into this. Um, my understanding, though, is that there are some limitations to using the spectros sorry, spectroscopy um, at a large scale. So while it has been done in a research setting, uh, if you're wanting to measure soil carbon across the whole farm, um, I'm not sure the capability is there to do that yet via drones. It certainly made some good advances though. And uh, in terms of land use, we're certainly using satellite imagery to help with that. Uh, but the actual soil carbon, um, those measurements by drone, uh, they're commercially available in other countries. I'm not sure if we have anyone doing that in Australia just yet. So. Uh, compared with even three or four years ago, there have been advances, um, but not to the point where it can just have broad scale use. Um, I, I'd like to add to that. There's some projects currently um, being worked on. I think they're using uh, Landsat data. Um, I can um, get you in touch with people that know more about that, but um, yeah, Part of uh, our project is part of a larger project, the Carbon Storage Partnership, uh, looking at um, ways MLA can meet its 2030 goal. And I know that there's some work that addresses that as part of that project. Thank, thank you. I just had one other quick quick question. Um, so Natalie, particularly you, you highlighted the fact that um, improving soil carbon improves farm profitability. Um, and that's a, and that's an awesome result. But I guess there's been a lot of discussion about whether um, taxpayers should be funding uh, farmers for increasing soil carbon. And if you're telling us that, in fact, you know, it improves soil, it improves um, farm profitability, doesn't that suggest that 
you know, all farmers should be just doing this. And we, you know, as taxpayers, perhaps we shouldn't be funding farmers to sequester carbon in their soil if it just improves their profitability already. Uh, improving soil organic matter um, does have links with improved profitability. Uh, I can see your point in terms of uh, the taxpayers funding soil carbon sequestration. Um, to be honest, though, we are finding the options that farmers are implementing tend to be more those options that have co-benefits. So when uh, farmers use those options, it's often not through the emissions reductions fund. I mean, obviously some farmers have gone that way, but there are uh, administrative overheads in um, using some of those methods. And so we're actually finding that a, a lot of farmers, they will improve their soil carbon just on their own without actually seeking the compensation through you know, a carbon offset. Um, so, I don't have an issue with it being funded, but I do suspect that um, it may not be taken up as much as those farmers that are um, just putting in, um, you know, improving their soils for their own productivity benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question we've got is from David Caroli. Uh, so David, if you're there, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Thanks, Kate. And uh, I've got a question for both uh, Rochelle and for Nat, and it's the $64 trillion question. Maybe it's only $64 billion in Australia, but we know that there have been current and future increases in both temperature extremes, in bushfire frequency and intensity, and in droughts in many regions across Australia, completely support your efforts on nature-based solutions and on tree planting. But how can farmers best, if you like, respond to minimising the physical risks associated with climate change on temperature extremes, on bushfires, on drought, while still maintaining their mitigation efforts? Yeah, it's a really good question <laughs> because yes. there's, uh, I mean, rainfall amount um, is one of the few ways that we can really determine the potential of carbon sequestration, particularly in soil. So if rainfall is reduced and we have more drought situations, then the ability of our soils to sequester carbon becomes less. And so there are definitely some issues that need to be considered, like trees are so good because, well, on livestock systems, they do provide the shade and the shelter that's also needed with a warming climate. Um, yet I do know farmers that have gone about planting some trees and those trees have all died due to a drying climate. Um, and so it may be a matter of having the right information out there in terms of tree species. I think as we go forward in terms of decades into the future, there's going to be less and less potential for carbon sequestration, not that it shouldn't be pursued or that the potential is not there, just less than um, we currently have. Um, and Rochelle might want to comment in terms of tree species and, and matching up um, the right species for the particular farm. Yeah, that, that's one um, way to sort of climate proof uh, uh, your options. Um, I, yeah, it's going to be very difficult for farmers to, um, it, particularly in regions of Australia that are gonna see reduced rainfall um, to keep their uh, carbon stocks, in, particularly in soils. So it's definitely an issue. And I think it highlights really the need for um, broad mitigation across the, the whole of the economy so that we're not dealing with quite as large of impacts 
as um, could be the case if we're slow to act. Thanks for the question, David, and thanks for your answers, Rochelle and Natalie. Um, the next question we have is from Sebastian Klein. So Sebastian, you're there and would like to unmute. That would be great. Thanks, I'll, I'll sneak it in before I have to boost to another Zoom. Um, I might broaden the question out a little bit in terms of what methods or what, what approaches to improving soil carbon were examined in, in your studies, Rachel, and, and whether biochar or other things like um, compost were examined as well, particularly for, for long-term stable carbon that either mimics or improves on native carbon capacity in soils. Yeah, um, so my study was just a modeling study. It's just looking at what is the impacts of having the different values of carbon, not looking at ways that you can actually increase it. And um, I am aware that um, compost is a good option uh, for getting those increases. I don't, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of research available on that currently. And it's um, impeded a bit by costs, um, but uh, yeah, the the study that I did looked at what you could expect carbon to increase um, associated with a change to grazing. So um, grazing uh, stores more carbon in soils than cropping, and that was the level of um, of carbon increase that was uh, that was compared. But um, there are trade-offs with that because um, clearly grazing systems have greater emissions due to having livestock in them. So um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know if you have uh, more information on sort of compost or um, regenerative agriculture um, options. Uh, on, only that there's very good anecdotal evidence in terms of regenerative agriculture that um, just the improvement across the whole farm system um, by using um, the composting methods versus synthetic fertilizers. So um, it requires more research, but I think there are some good options there. Thanks. I, I think there's some interesting synergies between trees on farms and fire risk control and the biochar piece, so perhaps one for future research. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, we've just got one more question in the chat that I'll just go through quickly before we wrap it up. Um, so it's from Corinne. Is there advice for farmers in tracking their data in a consistent way so they can evidence their carbon neutral status, particularly for export? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, the most important thing is to start recording your data. Uh, farmers often know the information, but it might be in their heads and that does change um, more than we remember year on year. So the first thing is um, start making records. I would recommend that you um, download some of the simple uh, models, there's the greenhouse and agriculture tools, and just have a look at the inputs that are needed to calculate uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from your farms. And they're the types of things that uh, you should be recording. So if it's a livestock system, you wanna look at livestock numbers um, plus animal weights, for example. If you're wanting to um, measure the soil carbon or the carbon in trees, then um, try and get samples of different soil types and um, start testing them every year so that you can build up that data and start looking at the, the long-term trends. Uh, but there, there's a fair amount of data that's um, required. And I think a, a lot of it farmers may have, it's just starting to keep accurate records and finding out what you're not currently recording. Um, and so you can start to do that. And I mentioned these models, not 
that you have to go in and use the models. It's more to have an understanding of the type of information that you should be recording so that the carbon balance can then be calculated for the farm. Thank you. Um, just before I hand over to Peter, I've just put a link to a survey in the chat. So if you could please fill that out to let us know how you found the seminar and so we can improve for next time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate. And thanks everyone. Thanks particularly to the speakers, to, to Nat and Rochelle. Um, clearly an immense topic. There's kind of enough topics been opened that there's a full series in discussing this. And it's, it's clearly particularly uh, germane to Australia, not just because it's a um, a significant proportion of our emissions, but because it's one that's that's, that's so contested, that's, that's so much in the, in the public eye and public space at the moment. And it's, it's um, obviously fantastic to get a research perspective uh, on that. Thanks to everyone for, for um, listening in at an unusual time for us. Uh, I expect very few Europeans were here, um, but, um, but it was, was uh, really good to see a, a good number of people turning up. Um, and also for the, the questions, uh, it's, it's clearly uh, looking at the range of them, a topic where there's gonna be a, um, a very broad uh, interest and uh, tremendous number of perspectives that we're gonna have to bring to this. Um, a comment just to keep a, a check on upcoming seminars. Um, November is actually, um, we have a few more coming up through November, again, across a pretty broad range of topics. Uh, more around nature-based solutions, but but other topics as well. Um, and the project will now be continuing into the new year. So uh, although things will probably go a little quieter in December, as they of course do, uh, we'll actually be running a seminar series through into the start of next year. So thanks very much and look forward to seeing many of you at the next talk.